I don't know if, if uh, Susan wants to click on that. She was on the phone a second ago, so she may not be available. Um, but for the benefit of those who are unable to join us live and would like to uh, go through this presentation a little bit later, um, we'll make sure that, that this is indeed being recorded. Um, I don't know, Susan, can you, can you uh, let us know if it is indeed being recorded already? Have you started the recording? Yes, it's, it just started. Okay. Right. It'll be on YouTube hopefully this afternoon. Okay, perfect. I just didn't want to start. I normally see a little indicator saying this is being recorded, but I don't see that right now. So I, in the left hand corner. Does anyone see it? Yes. You see it? Okay. Yes. Oh, I do. I do now. Okay. All right. Well, then let us go ahead and uh, we'll begin with, with prayer. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together. And we thank you for the technology that enables us to do this even during a time of social distancing. We pray for your peace and your calm and your healing to grip our land and to, uh, to lead to a transformation of hearts and relationships. And we pray that in this time, you would be speaking in our hearts and guiding our, our, our thinking and our, our processing as we delve into the very deep and, and refreshing waters of your word, especially as we, we look at this, this, new, uh, this New Testament that you've given to us through the revealed word of Jesus Christ. We ask that you be with us in this time, and we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for being here this morning. I, I appreciate your time, and I also appreciate your ministry. I value uh, what you all commit to do, and, um, and, and it's, it's wonderful. And uh, it's truly a gift to the people of God uh, throughout this region, and uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm Jack. I, uh, I serve the Bedford Congregation. And uh, they, they asked if, uh, if, if um, I would do the New Testament class for this, this cycle. And it kind of ended up coinciding with um, something that I've been looking into a little bit more in depth, and that's uh, the letter to the Galatians. And as I was thinking about the um, New Testament as a whole, it, it, you know, it strikes me that a lot of times we, we think of the Gospels as the beginning of the New Testament because, you know, the Gospels come first. You know, we, we begin with Matthew and, and read the stories of Jesus and, and transition into Acts and read the history of, of the early movement that, uh, that was following Christ and, and disseminating the, the word throughout the, the known world at that time. And you know, a lot of times we, we focus on that, and rightly so. Uh, however, as we, we think about the New Testament, to me it's interesting to think about it in terms of the, the epistles coming first. They were, they were earlier than the Gospels. They were, they were composed uh, earlier. And, and there's not a lot of understanding as to how the, the epistles influenced the writing of the Gospels and the development of the Christology and the theology that we, we draw from the uh, canonical Gospels. And, and so I, I've been intrigued by this, and, and I thought it'd be a nice place for us to, to put our focus on today. Rather than try to do a whole survey of the New Testament, we could kind of step back. And, and I find um, that there's a lot of uh, credence to this as, as we look at a, a, a line from, from Acts. Uh, and if you, uh, if you follow the lectionary, this will sound familiar. It was a few weeks ago. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Uh, that was one of the hallmarks of the early community following Jesus. They were attending to the apostles' teaching. And this this earliest teaching was transmitted orally, um, and 
uh, it was it was delivered um, uh, to them around tables uh, in synagogue meetings. Uh, they they were out preaching on street corners. The the apostles were out there proclaiming the word uh, very orally. You know, to, a lot of times today, as, as good Presbyterians, we like to think about uh, preach the gospel at all times, use words when necessary. And so you don't find many Presbyterians standing on street corners preaching or, or you know, holding up something and saying, you know, repent, the kingdom of God has come near. Uh, we've, we've shifted the way we transmit the, the gospel message. In this earliest uh, uh, community, that is exactly how uh, this, this was done. And the message continued to spread. You know, you look at Acts and, and Luke's uh, story of how the church began to grow and, and expand. And you begin to see all the different cross-cultural currents coming into play, different language groups, different uh, understandings of Judaism. You know, it's helpful to remember that in the ancient world, there was not one strain of Judaism. There were Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, uh, there, there were Zealots. There, there were all these different strands of thinking in, within Judaism itself, and a lot of that had to do with the diaspora. Uh, after exile, as, as the, the, the Jewish people were scattered around the globe, uh, they had to rethink several things. What did it mean to be a Jew without a temple? The temple was so central to who they were. What did it mean now to be Jewish and not have the temple? What did it mean to be Jewish in the different cultural contexts in which they found themselves? Babylon, Assyria, uh, Persia, Egypt. What, what did all that mean? And so, um, and then the influence of Hellenism coming in and impacting all of that. So how did it, how did you be, be Jewish in those contexts? Well, that, teases itself out not only in the way that the, uh, that the Jewish traditions changed and, and uh, adapted, it also influenced the way people were understanding the teachings of the apostles and how they incorporated those into uh, who they were. Um, and so you, you've got all these different strands kind of at, at play here. And so the question then becomes, well, Catholic <laughs> witness was the right one. Uh, you know, if you have six people in a room, you're going to have at least eight opinions. So, you know, imagine that happening now with this upstart movement, uh, this, this ragtag group of diverse folks um, speaking to more diverse communities about this new movement, trying to understand what it means and, and how it functions and how we are to understand it. And so, um, you know, we tend to think about the, some of the more prominent apostolic witnesses that we have uh, uh, a lot of information either based on their own epistles or based on what Luke shares with us in Acts and what the Gospels share with us. And so you've, you've, as you read those carefully, you begin to see that there were indeed different ways of understanding what it meant to be a follower of Christ and a part of the way. Um, and again, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard for us to wrap our minds around. At this time, nobody's calling themselves Christian. That, that comes a little bit later. Um, and, and so they're not understanding themselves necessarily as different, uh, a different religion. Um, they're, they're, they're trying to understand themselves within the um, under the umbrella of Judaism and now all of a sudden um, there's a movement to not only include Jews but also to include uh, groups like the Samaritans who were part Jewish and then there was a movement to embrace uh, an even broader community bringing in the Gentiles and, and making making this a, an inclusive faith that was, um, that was available to all people. And that calls into question uh, the, you know, what, how do non-Jews become Christians, which is, you know, Christ followers, which is under this, this Jewish umbrella, 
how does all that work if they're not following the law? And we're going to look at that uh, pretty in depth today. You've got people like Peter and James, and, and we might hear of them called the Jerusalem faction. Uh, they're part of this focused group that is intent on reaching uh, <coughs> If, if, again, if you're following the lectionary, Jesus calls them the lost sheep of Israel. Okay, and so how do they do that? Um, and that's where their focus is. And then you've got Paul coming into play here, and, and he really upsets the apple cart in a lot of ways. Um, and, and this is really interesting. He's, he's formerly known as a persecutor of the way. He's, he's going after these Christ followers. He's seeing them as, uh, as, as being untrue to their, their faith, the faith that he is zealous for, the, the Jewish faith. Um, and, and he sees them as a threat uh, and, and as an anomaly. And so he's really focused and intent on eradicating them. Well, all of a sudden he has this call conversion experience and now he becomes just as zealous for christ and and disseminating the gospel of christ and so he comes into play and he believes that his gospel is for gentiles and so we're getting these two focus groups getting uh kind of running into each other and so these conflicts lead to wrestling, they lead to infighting, um, they lead to conflict and questioning as to whether Paul's gospel is valid, um, especially since he's an outsider. Yet we can't ignore the fact that Paul existed because his ministry was so prolific. We have so many of his writings available and they're so influential, not only to the the forming of, of canonized scripture, uh, they're also uh, pretty foundational to the way we understand and practice our faith today. So, so they, uh, they have a lot of authority. Um, ultimately, and I don't think Peter, James, or Paul, or anybody uh, in, in that cohort would ever disagree that really it's Jesus's gospel. That's the key for them. Uh, it, you know, they understood that they were not always on the same page, but it always remained the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as long as that was what was front and center, they were able to work out their differences. And as we get into Galatians, we're going to see an experience where Jesus was not front and center in Paul's eyes, and that is where a arises. And so, uh, that becomes important later on. Now, as, um, as we, we begin to talk about Paul and understanding his gospel in its place before the canonized gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, we, we think about his letters. Now, there's, um, there are 13 letters that are attributed to Paul. And out of those, there are some that are deemed authentic or undisputed. These are ones that the majority of scholarship in, in biblical studies believes, without a doubt, are indeed written by Paul or were dictated by Paul. Uh, Paul didn't necessarily sit down and write these letters. A lot of times in the ancient world, uh, people in a position like Paul's would have had a or many secretaries. Um, and so, uh, you look at these undisputed letters, uh, things like Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, which many scholars believe is the early uh, of the Pauline epistles that we have access to, and Philemon. Um, those are the ones that, that most scholarship says, absolutely, these are definitely Paul's letters their, uh, their theology is consistent, their writing style is consistent, the tone is consistent, the concerns are consistent. They're, you know, um, even though they're addressed to particular groups of people going through particular things, there are threads that connect all of them in significant ways that make us think that um, these are indeed uh, genuinely Paul's letters. Now, you look at the other letters and 
their scholarship says, hey, we're not as, as uh, sure about this. Um, and, and again, this is remembering our original copies of anything from the Bible in existence that we have. Uh, so these are, we're basing all of this on copies of copies that are decades, if not hundreds of years old, or than when they were originally composed. Um, and so letters like Second Thessalonians, um, it, about 50% of scholars think that, um, and this is rough, this is approximation, there's no hard and fast evidence to say this is it, but based on a survey of you know, a lot of biblical scholars, we get to an idea that they're roughly half of them think Second Thessalonians is written by Paul. Um, some of those that believe it is uh, even place it earlier than First Thessalonians. Um, uh, so there's there's a lot of debate um, in that. Colossians, a little less certainty there. Ephesians, surprisingly, because Ephesians and Colossians are both uh, documents, letters, epistles that continue to have a lot of weight and are often attributed to Paul, yet you can see there's a pretty high number of um, guys and gals who study this uh, ad nauseum who think, no, we're not convinced that those belong to Paul. And that may not necessarily be that Paul didn't write those. Paul may have written or, or dictated sections of those letters, and uh, other people may have come in and, and, and added to them. A lot of times as, as letters were circulated, this happens a lot in, in biblical text, and that's why those little notes in your Bible are important. A lot of times in biblical texts, what you'll see happening is as they get disseminated, uh, somebody comes along and says, oh, that doesn't really mean that, and they'll scratch it out and write something different there, and and that becomes part of the, the tradition and the history. And as, as archaeologists, historians, biblical scholars, they, they look at all these different copies or, or different traditions of documents, and they have to reconcile all those changes and try to figure out which came first, you know, this idea or that idea. It, it's not cut and dry. And, and so it leads to a lot of uncertainty. It leads to a of, well, maybe Paul wrote this part of Ephesians and Colossians, but maybe not this part of Ephesians and Colossians. Um, you know, maybe his secretaries, as they were dic taking dictation, they thought, oh, you know, Paul's getting a little dotty here. We, we're going to clean this up a little bit, you know, and, and they just interject their own language or, or thinking. Um, so, you know, it's all very nuanced. Uh, second and First Timothy and Titus all have a very... Uh, a high degree of doubt as to whether they actually are by Paul. You might see that and think, well, if they're not by Paul, what are they doing in the Bible? Um, they're not untrue or they're, you know, the, the process of canonization was thorough and in depth and it was, we believe, guided by the Holy Spirit. And so these, these documents belong in our, in our scripture. God is using those texts. Just because we are not sure if they are actually written by Paul doesn't mean that they're not valid and they're not worthy of our, our attention. Uh, what it does indicate is, is that Paul was very popular. And, and one of the uh, practices in the ancient world was that students and disciples of their teacher, a as a way of demonstrating what a fine teacher they were and, and what good students they were, would frequently write in the style of their teacher and attribute their writings to their teacher. Now, we would, you know, as quite modern 21st century folks, uh, we would be appalled at that, you know, like, oh my goodness, you know, that would be terrible for, for Jack to sit down and write a letter and put the Apostle Paul's name on it and, and pretend that the Apostle, that's pretty arrogant, that's pretty unethical. Um, we would take exception to that. In the ancient world, that was very popular, it was very common, and it was seen as a way of paying homage, uh, a homage to your, your teacher, um, of flattering them. Um, so a little bit of a different way of, of thinking about it. Now, uh, in all of these documents, uh, there's uh, an early 
a church understanding of what the gospel is all about. And this is different than sharing an autobiographical story or a historical narrative of the life of Jesus Christ. They are trying to distill what is good news and how do we live as people who uh, uh, profess faith in this good news. Um, and so for Paul, that's more than just words. It's power. He calls it the power of God for salvation. And for Paul, it's a power that leads to experience, transformation, and activity. The experience is knowing Jesus Christ. However, specifically knowing Jesus Christ crucified. That is so key to understanding what Paul means when he talks about the gospel. Then that experience leads to transformation. And that transformation is manifest in the idea of being co-crucified with Christ. Okay, so, so Paul is going to talk about death, uh, a death of the flesh, a death to the self, death to the world, uh, death to the powers, the cosmic powers. Um, you know, for Paul, uh, the gospel is painful. It leads to death. Yet, because it's co-crucifixion with Christ, it also means that we participate in Christ's resurrection. The new creation, the new life, ergo, this is a transformation. It's not death for death's sake. It's death for the sake of the new life to be effective in us. And so if we are experienced people who have gone, undergone transformation, then Paul says that will lead to new activity. Uh, new activity that is manifest in uh, new, uh, um, new fruit of the faith. Uh, and that's going to be things like gratitude. Uh, moral and ethical lifestyle choices, and genuine love. Genuine love is so important for Paul. We, if you've ever been to a wedding, you've heard 1 Corinthians 13 read out of context because a bride and a groom feel like, oh my goodness, this is such a beautiful poetic passage about love, and it is, it's glorious, and um, you know, love love conquers all, and it's just such a beautiful concept, and Paul has this poetic way of, of portraying love. And then, you know, I, I often say to couples, if they select that passage, it's, it's love because there's so much conflict. And Paul is trying to address the conflict between this group of Christians. And so, um, you know, it, we have to understand what Paul is really talking about there when, when he's talking about uh, this genuine love. Uh, it's an abs it, it, it is an, uh, it's a way of being um, together uh, in, in a Christian way without conflict. So once we, we, we receive this gospel, we're, we experience it, we're transformed by it, and we're, we're becoming more active in it, um, what we discover is that God is for us. That's what Paul believes. The gospel shows us that God is for us and not against us, and that God is giving us gift, the gift of faith, the gift of grace and forgiveness. And the gifts that we receive give us a distinct set of interrelated benefits, all right? And, and you know, uh, sometimes we might bristle at the idea of receiving, you know, uh, something because of, of our faith, like, Wait a minute, I, you know, you know, like these these uh, these sign-on bonuses, so to speak. Um, however, Paul is saying this is just uh, this is just part of God's uh, gracious gift to us, and so he talks about these really large concepts that are full and packed of meaning. He's trying to convey the importance of them to these communities that he has founded and that he pastors. And he's trying to show them that they have all this already. There's nothing more they have to do to receive these things. And since they have them, they should be using them. What an insult it is to receive a gift and never use it. Uh, you know, the person that gives you the gift would be hurt 
um, if, if they didn't think you appreciated the gift that, that you gave them. And so Paul is trying to impart to his, his congregations that you've got these gifts, now go and use them. So one of the biggies is, is justification or righteousness. So it's to be in a right covenantal relationship with the righteous God right now. You're already in this relationship with God right now. Covenantal, God has sealed it. It's part of who you are. And it means that you, it's a down payment. It means that you can be assured that in the future, you will be acquitted by God on that day of judgment. And not because of anything you've done or anything you can do. That is not what makes you righteous or justified. What makes that a reality for you is Christ. Christ is the source of our righteousness. And that is such a key thing for Paul. Uh, and we're going to see that over and over again when we look at Galatians. Paul also says, you've received reconciliation and peace. He says, look, there was enmity between you and God. There was a division you were not, uh, as, you, as you were, you weren't right with God. And so God chooses to bridge that divide. God uses Christ to that purpose. Christ becomes our mediator, our peace. He bridges that divide for us. We also receive forgiveness. This is a benefit of the gospel. And uh, forgiveness uh, for Paul um, was really important because, again, remember, as the Jewish people used the sacrificial system. Um, I'm going to ask if um, I'm going to ask if if you uh, if you can mute yourselves unless you have a question uh, or want to interject something, um, and that way we can all uh, hear hear okay. Thank you. Um, so. Paul is using the, he's subscribing to the sacrificial system, the, the, the temple uh, system of atonement. And, and so when, when uh, a Jewish person commits a sin or trespass against God and neighbor, um, there's an atonement uh, sacrifice required. And, and so that's how they receive forgiveness, whether that's a grain offering or a burnt offering, a, whatever that was for whatever sin they committed, they needed to do that. They needed to make it right. Um, and so in, in the gospel, uh, what happens then is that Christ's death is the, the atoning uh, sacrifice that yields forgiveness and remission for our sins. Um, we don't make the sacrifice. Christ does on our behalf. And then there, so, and again, these are all interrelated. Uh, redemption or liberation uh, is a benefit of the gospel. And this is the idea that we are in bondage to sin. And we're also in bondage to these hostile cosmic powers that are rampant in the universe. And a lot of times we, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, we get uncomfortable talking about powers and principalities and demonic forces and uh, that's not exactly fertile ground for Presbyterians. Um, it's a reality for Paul. And, and you know, it's another way that, that we sometimes can understand this is thinking about the, the corporate systematic evils in our world that are working to oppress people and, and deprive them of the experience of abundant life. Um, and, you know, right now, really... A, a prominent conversation in our society right now is is race and uh, racial reconciliation. And I believe that Paul would look at some of the systematic processes that in our world um, in terms of race and poverty. Uh, and, and he would say though he might he might very well call those cosmic powers in the universe. Um, I think looking at at uh, the imperial system under which he lived, uh, under, by the hand of the Roman elite. Um, I think that for Paul would be thought of as a cosmic power. Um, they weren't just attributed to one single individual. These were very systematic, ingrained, uh, secure systems that had a pernicious power 
and influence over great swaths of people and territories. And, and for that, there's no way that an individual can, can repent of that. It, it needs a, a communal corporate repentance. And so the only way that can be achieved uh, for Paul is, is by God. God has to be the one who does that. And so God does that through Christ. He's our liberator. He's the one who redeems us and liberates us from sin and from corporate, our individual sin and our corporate sin. Um, and, and so Paul, when he talks about this, oftentimes uses language that would have been used in the slave markets of the ancient world. So, so he's, he's talking about us being held as slaves um, to the world, to, the, to sin, to the powers, um, and, and that redemption and liberation doesn't just set us free and, and launch us into the world to be our own people. It, it, it transfers us from, from, the, from slavery to sin and the world and the powers to being slaves of Christ. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that later on because that can be a little tricky for people. Um, however, it, Paul always talks about it in terms of being free and liberated. Um, and so that is now secure and complete when we are resurrected bodily. So again, there's an idea uh, in this, in justification, that there's a, a right now aspect and there's also a future aspect. Um, what, uh, what you may hear sometimes uh, referred to as an eschatological hope, uh, that, that it will be made complete after whatever, uh, when, whenever, whenever we get to whatever comes next, that heaven um, resurrection, however that, that uh, looks. So, um, you know, that's what he's talking about here. He talks about present resurrection as well as this idea of the future resurrection. Um, and, and again, this talks about the idea of being co-crucified with Christ. Now we are raised to new life with Christ through his resurrection. And ironically, it, the lifestyle that we now live conforms to the cross. It's loving, it's, it's serving. And so the present resurrection that we have shows us that Christ is our current life. All right, Christ is our new life. The other benefit, another benefit we get is incorporation into the people of God. We become members of the body of Christ. That's a very beautiful image that Paul offers us. We become part of the new creation. We become part of the Israel of God. All right. And that's important. You know, not just, we're not, Paul doesn't say to the Gentiles, you are now part of the nation of Israel. He says, you are part of the Israel of God. There's this theological, ethereal idea that there's a, there's a, uh, an Israel that's not connected to a, a specific place, a geographical location. It's this idea of a heavenly Israel. And, and that's what Paul's talking about here. Um, he, he talks about people uh, together being the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, a lot of times uh, when I was growing up, uh, I always heard of the temple of the Holy Spirit as being about your own individual body. And so you were supposed to treat your own personal body with respect because your own personal body was the temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul, when he talks about it, actually, it's, it's not just about an individual thing. It's, it's a corporate thing. Uh, we, as the people of God, together are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So this incorporation is Paul's way of stressing that we together constitute a covenant people of God. And that Christ and subsequently us in Christ um, form community. And community is so important for Paul. Um, so that's one of the benefits we receive from the gospel. We also get the gift of the Spirit. Uh, and this is huge. This is God's personal presence in us, Christ's presence in us, personally and communally. Are you, are you picking up this theme here that Paul is very communally minded? So this spirit, which is Christ's indwelling power, makes known the love of God and makes possible the life that we are called to live, the life of faith, hope, and love. So, you know, so, so these, these three things are foundational for us, and it's the spirit working through us that enables us to achieve those foundational goals. 
And the other, one of the other benefits we receive is the certainty of God's love. Um, this is, we, we, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus Christ. Um, and this uh, gift of Christ is all the proof that we need to see God's love in action. And it, it has been effectual in the past. It is effectual right now. And the fact that those two things are true should give us the assurance that they will continue to be true into the future. So Christ alone is our demonstration of God's love for us. We receive sanctification. Christ enables us and desires for us to embody a holy lifestyle that is distinctive and countercultural, and that is appropriate for people of the covenant. So we are called to be holy, and we are called to continue to make ourselves holy. We are not called to fit in with the world. Okay, if, if we see something going on and everybody's on board with it, Paul says, that doesn't mean you need to join that and be on the bandwagon. Uh, you know, more often than not, the walk of faith is going to put you at odds with popular opinion. If, if, if something's getting a lot of traction in, in the broader community, that's a good indication that we should take a step back and a closer examination to say, is this really a mark of holiness that I bear because I've been baptized, crucified, and risen with Christ? Um, nowhere in the gospel or in, in the epistles uh, is there any indication that um, being a follower of Jesus is going to make you popular. Uh, Jesus talks about ridicule. Uh, Jesus talks about persecution. Jesus talks about martyrdom. Um, these are not these are not typically selling points. You know, I, I don't I don't hear the recruiter for the elk saying, "Hey, join the elks, and people will make fun of you and and throw rocks at you." Um, that's not generally a selling point for clubs and organizations. Um, and it's it, you know, and, and that's to show us that Christianity is not a club. It's not an organization. It's it's not a networking opportunity. Um, it's, it's a way of life. It, it's a way of, of being and being different and distinct. Um, one of the other benefits we get is deliverance from wrath. And that good news. Um, and sometimes a lot of people just focus on this one. They look at uh, Jesus Christ and the gospel as a, a get out of hell free card, or I've even heard it called fire insurance. I, I just, you know, I, what, what witticism? However, it makes me shake my head. Look at this list thus far, and we're not even done yet. All of these things are benefits of the gospel, and we just focus on getting out of hell or avoiding eternal damnation. Um, we miss out on so much. Yes, Paul does believe in a future day of judgment um, in which people will be held accountable and, and which they will be subject to divine wrath in Paul's understanding for being unbelieving and disobedient. However, that's held up next to the idea of God's love. And we have to wrestle with that. And so if God loved us enough to send God's son to die um, in order to save us from whatever coming wrath might be, we can believe that Christ is our security. However, that's not the only thing that, that God does for us through Christ. And so we shouldn't just focus specifically on that or neither on salvation. Because, again, that refers to especially a future experience of God's grace and glory that results from the justification that we receive. And we are delivered from wrath, and we are delivered from all of our enemies, from sin and from death, right now and in the life to come. So we can count on Christ being our hope. Again, this is not the only thing that the gospel assures us of or grants to us. And then finally, the gospel grants us glorification. We, again, we know what our goal is. We know where we're going and getting there is, is uh, when we will be glorified with Christ. We, our transformation will be made complete. We will be made perfect in the likeness of Christ, in the image of God that God created us in that beautiful image that will be restored we will be glorified again, and that is our goal. So where do these benefits come from? Well, 
Paul says they ultimately come from God's grace manifested in Christ, centered in the cross, confirmed by the resurrection, made effective by the Spirit, and experienced in community, which is for us the church. So it, it, it's a very complex, uh, detailed method that Paul develops through his epistles and through the theology that, that he is, is distilling from what he knows of his experience in Jesus Christ. That is how the gospel comes to be functional and effectual through us. Now, many, if not all, of, of these benefits, um, we, can, we can see uh, Paul explicating in, um, in, in, the, gospel, in, the, uh, in the letter to the Galatians. And so um, I, I think that uh, it's, um, it's worthwhile our time to go and, and spend um, some time in that letter. Um, before we get there, I just wanted to pause and see if you have any questions, uh, any, any thoughts. So go ahead and unmute yourselves and, 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 and fire away. I covered a lot of material just there. So let's process it. Anybody? Y'all with me? <laughs> All right. All right. Does um, does everybody have uh, Galatians uh, or Bible with them that they they can be looking at Galatians? We're gonna we're gonna kind of move through. Uh, we're gonna move through the letter. All right. Um, I, I hope uh, you, uh, you, you've got some familiarity with Galatians. Um, if you haven't read it recently, that's fine. Uh, it, I, I, always, um, I always commend to folks, if you can, um, sit down and, and read um, uh, a letter or, or gospel from beginning to end. It, it's quite an experience. Uh, with my confirmation classes, um, I've, I've taken the opportunity to um, read the entire Gospel of Mark to them uh, in one sitting. And you would think, oh my goodness, that's, that's, that would be torture. Um, I tell you what, when you, with eighth graders, you would think that would be the most horrific thing in the world to sit down and read the entire Gospel of Mark in one sitting. Um, it was such, it, it, it ends up being such a powerful experience because they never, you know, kids today don't have that kind of attention span, generally speaking. Uh, and especially to hear somebody read to them for an extended period of time, uh, it gives them a whole new experience to that. And so if you can hear somebody read uh, the, the Bible to you, um, that actually gets you closer to the original experience of Scripture. Because uh, Paul would write these letters and he would dispatch them. And, and he would have folks um, in his service that would, would go to these churches and, and, and get up and read these letters. And so if, you ever, uh, if you've ever noticed uh, Phoebe uh, referenced in, in Romans, um, there, there's, some, uh, there's some pretty strong speculation that Phoebe was the one who delivered this letter to Rome and would stand in front of these congregations and read Paul's letter to them. Um, so it gets you to this, it gets you to the sense of the, the oral transmission of, of, of the scripture. Um, the other thing about reading it in, in, complete, in a complete sitting is, is that you begin to notice the, the streams of connection, the threads that, that tie these documents together. Um, and it's a really powerful experience. So I always commend that to people. Galatians is only six chapters long. It's not very long. You can sit down and read it from beginning to end in, in probably less than an hour. And it's, it, 
it's just such a rich and rewarding experience to be able to do that. You, you get the whole picture um, in one sitting. Uh, so I do commend that to you. Now, as we look at Galatians, um, one of the things that is striking about it is that uh, it's often been called the Magna Carta of Christian freedom. Paul really hammers the idea of freedom in Christ home in this letter. Um, and, and a lot of people, you know, look at that and they're like, yay, freedom, woohoo! Uh, and they read it like, um, like, you know, we often attribute to uh, Martin Luther, the idea that we can sin boldly. Do what you want to do. You're free, folks. Hey, God saved you. You can go out and live like you had never lived before because, hey, God's going to save you in the end, so don't worry about it. Um, William Barclay says, you know, is one of the ones that, one of the voices that has said, eh, not so fast. The freedom we have in Christ is not freedom to do as we like. It's freedom to do as we ought. Now, we, we've got to understand, at its very basic level, that when Paul is writing about Christian freedom in Galatians and elsewhere, this is not freedom to consume or dominate. It is freedom to love and to be transformed ever more into Christ's image and likeness, um, that we become more like our imago dei, the image of God in which we were created originally and which has become uh, marred. And so where the tension comes in for this is in thinking about, well, wait a minute. If Paul is saying we're free from living according to the constraints of the Torah, the law, how is our freedom limited? A limit on freedom doesn't seem like freedom. And, and so there's a big tension that's going to be played out in Galatians over this question. And, and we're going to um, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, as we look at Galatians, there's just some, uh, some overarching broad things that we'll take a look at. Um, the central claim that Paul is making in this letter is that there is absolutely nothing that can be or should be added to the gospel of the crucified Messiah and that uh, the liberating Holy Spirit, in a gospel that generates the fruit of the Spirit and cruciform faith and love. So this is what Paul is trying to convey as he sits down to write this letter. Um, and so one of the things that really comes out in this letter is the idea that we are justified by faith alone. You're going to hear me say it over and over again. Christ alone is sufficient. That is one of the things that Paul is stressing over and over and over again in this letter. Christ alone is sufficient. So as he's, uh, as he's um, delivering this message uh, to these people, he's addressing it in the context of these troublemakers that have come in to his churches in Galatia. These are missionaries, and um, we don't know exactly who they are. Um, they, some people believe they are, um, they are Jewish Christians from, from Jerusalem or, uh, or some part of Israel that have traveled to Galatia, and these Jewish Christians are coming into a Gentile church and saying, um, you need to be circumcised and you need to follow the law in order to truly be incorporated into the covenant community. Uh, they could very well be Galatian Christians um, that were local. And, and they, you know, Paul's come in, Paul's delivered this message of good news to the churches there. He's formed these communities. He's, he's launched them and he's gone away. And they're looking around and they're saying, whoa, 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 whoa. They are completely unorthodox. Uh, and we need to fix that. And so they come into their neighborhood uh, meeting houses and they say, you got it wrong. We're going to correct you and, and we're going to make it right here. Um, and, and so that um, that's the context in which Paul is writing. And uh, we, we see that this letter probably was written as early as 49 CE or as late as 55. 
So relatively uh, a short period of time following Christ's death. Uh, and again, you know, the Gospels were written much later. Um, and, and so, you know, some people believe Mark, which is the, usually thought of as the earliest Gospel, was written as late as 70. So, you know, there's, there's decades that, set can, that possibly separate um, these, these initial writings that, that we uh, read today. Um, and so <clears throat> a lot of people think that this letter uh, Galatia, to the Galatians was written um, probably closer to that 55 uh, year mark. And the reason they think that is because um, this letter bears so much uh, connection to Romans, which was written around that time. There's a lot of overlap and similarity. So the reason, another reason I felt like Galatians is a good place for us to look is because a lot of the things that we learn about or read about in Galatians are expounded in even more depth and detail in Romans. And so you can take this foundational material, and as you're reading Romans and preaching on Romans, you can apply it there as well. And so um, now who are these people that are uh, coming in here and rabble-rousing these these unsettlers. Well, um, they are, like I said, uh, advocates of um, the Galatians adopting um, a Jewish lifestyle, uh, even though they're Gentiles. Uh, he wants them to, the, these missionaries want them to become circumcised. They want them to follow the dietary laws and restrictions. They want them to become Jewish converts in order to uh, for them to fully be incorporated into the community of Christ, and so um, they were um, they they deeply revered the Mosaic law, and uh, they wanted um, uh, they wanted the Gentiles to come into the Commonwealth of Israel. They they weren't exclusive in that respect. They wanted to invite them in. However, they wanted to invite them in on their terms, and that is uh, that's a problem. And, and so um, their, their kind of thinking goes this way. They, they believe that Jesus was indeed the Messiah of Israel. So they, they, they're Jewish, but they believe that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And that, that Gentiles who wish to share in the benefits of Israel's Messiah must become descendants of Abraham. And in order to do that, they must be circumcised. And because that is the sign of the covenant, um, between Abraham and God and Abraham's descendants. Then following circumcision, they had to adopt this Jewish lifestyle and follow the Jewish law. And so for them, uh, Jesus's utmost significance or importance came from his ministry in teaching the law, not in, uh, not in Christ's cross, his crucifixion and, and subsequent resurrection. Um, you know, uh, and, and this isn't, this isn't anathema to Christianity. Uh, if you carefully read Matthew, you might be able to discern that there are a lot of parallels between Jesus's ministry as recorded in Matthew and Moses in, in, uh, the Old Testament. Uh, and, and there's a lot of speculation that the, the writer of Matthew was trying to recast Jesus as a new Moses. Um, you know, in, in, in Matthew, Jesus says he does not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law, and, and that not a dot or tittle will fall away from the law. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount is often seen as that Sinai moment uh, in in, in cast in new new light that that Jesus is is going up to the the Mount of Beatitudes um, in, in a similar fashion that Moses went up to Sinai to receive the tablets and and when Jesus gives this Sermon on the Mount which is you know written on the tablets of their hearts um, he starts not with with uh, thou shalt and thou shalt not he starts with uh, Beatitudes the blessings the you are blessed if you do this. You are blessed if you do that. And then the, the sermon continues on with a whole litany of, you have heard it said, 
Where were they, these things said in the law? But I tell you, and, and he goes to explicate the law. So, so Jesus becomes the interpreter of the law uh, in Matthew. And so, you know, there's not, this isn't a bad thing uh, necessarily. But Paul does take exception to the fact that this is what becomes most important and singular for these missionaries. And Paul says that's just not accurate, and that's not um, what the gospel is all about. So he counters their logic with, um, with this. If, if, if God had indeed sent Jesus into the world, and, and Jesus gave himself for our sins, then it can never be possible that the purpose of the law was to justify sinners or give them life. If the law could accomplish that, there would be no purpose or reason for Jesus to have come. So Paul says, logically, it doesn't make sense. It, it's not playing out here. So he has, to, he has to appropriate the law in light of Christ. And as a Jew, he is uniquely... Uh, as, a, as a zealot Jew, as a Pharisee, he is uniquely equipped to be able to do this. He's a smart, logical man. I mean, he, he is a great thinker. Um, not all the time. Some of his logic's a little funny. Not all of his illustrations hit the mark. As a whole, though, on a whole, though, brilliant. God knew exactly what to do, what, what was going on when, when God called Paul to do this ministry. So, so Paul deduces that the law has had a temporary role in God's plan, and it's served humanity as a disciplinarian, showing right from wrong until Christ came, and Christ is the true offspring of Abraham, and that is something that he's going to stress throughout this letter. So then Paul uh, traces this argument to the conclusion that people are not justified by doing the works of the law, but by entrusting themselves to what God has done in Christ. That, that is how Paul might sum up his thinking in Galatians. Now, up to this point in the crisis, um, uh, Paul has... Uh, commended the church for um, the evidence that they've demonstrated in, in the spirit uh, manifesting itself in miracles in their presence. He commends them for their prayer life. Um, he commends them for their right living. And he says, up until very recently, you were running well. You had it. You were following the gospel that I had, had preached to you, and, and you were doing a great job. These missionaries, these unsettlers, these circumcisers, they came in and they upset the apple cart. And now Paul feels the need, the compulsion to get them back on track, to get them back on the straight and narrow. And in some ways, Paul is adopting the role of the law that he's advocating. He's, he's becoming the disciplinarian. And, and so Paul would say, I'm not saving you, Galatians. I, I'm not here to save you. That's God's job, and God does that through Jesus Christ. I'm here to kind of nudge you back into compliance with Christ, to get you back on the page of the gospel. And so he, he, he does that very early in the letter. He establishes uh, a framework in, in verse 4 of chapter 1. He says, look, the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what, has, this is what Christ has done. Christ has given himself for us, for our sins. And he has done that to set us free from the present evil age. So there's something at work already in the here and now in, in the gospel life. It's not just, you know, it, again, it's not just some heavenly ideal goal future thing. It's here and now. Um, a lot of times, if, if, you, 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 if you think about the Gospel of John, where uh, Jesus talks about eternal life, a lot of people think about that as life after death. Jesus does not limit it to that. When Jesus talks about eternal life, 
that life begins at the moment of belief. And so if you like to think of yourself as a Christian, if, if you believe yourself to be a person of faith, guess what? You are already living the eternal life. And so it's obviously not just something reserved for heaven. So there's something about the present that is important. And Paul establishes this very early on. And Jesus Christ has done this according to the will of our God and Father. So these three phrases suggest that Paul in this letter is going to focus on Christ's death on the cross, which is the core of his gospel. And he's going to focus on that in chapters one and two. And then he's going to switch uh, to thinking about the plan of God that the Father promises in Scripture. And that's chapters three and four. And that is to the point, to, to get us to the point that we can understand that the cross is the means by which people are liberated from the present evil age so that we can live in the realm of the spirit here and now. These are, these are active things uh, that we are to be engaged in. And one of the key distinctions that I'll make now and repeat is that these are not requirements for salvation. The, the living the right life, the spiritual life, the sanctified life. We don't do that to earn our salvation. We do that because of our salvation. And that's going to become a recurrent theme for Paul. And, you know, when we think about this in terms of the Reformation, uh, Martin Luther fell in love with this letter to the point uh, and the extent that he actually called Galatians, his wife. I mean, you know, <laughs> you, you, if you think about it, uh, you know, somebody says, oh, I love this. And somebody snarkily says, well, if you love it so much, why don't you marry it? Um, and, you know, for, for Martin Luther, he did. He said, I'm going to marry this letter. I love it so much. It's my bride. Um, it, because it talks about the good news that that we cannot do anything to earn our salvation. We can't do anything to uh, secure it. However, you better believe that we, we are to be doing, uh, we are to be living rightly and spiritually because we've been set free and because we've been saved. Like that, that is so key for Paul. Um, a lot of times people think that we've been let off the hook. And that's, that's not, uh, again, it's not freedom for freedom's sake. It's freedom for Christ. So Paul is an apostle. He, he calls himself an apostle. He, in this letter, he establishes his credentials as an apostle. However, um, there's some debate about, you know, how does he get this designation? Uh, if you look back at Acts, uh, early in, in the book of Acts, um, after Judas's death, uh, they're setting out to find a replacement for him. And, and it, it's written in Acts. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For it is one of these who must become a witness with us of his resurrection. All right, so if you're looking for a job description for an apostle, guess what? None of us fit the bill. We were not with Jesus the whole time that he was living among us. We were not there when he was baptized by John. We were not there when he taught. We were not there when he healed. We were not there when he was crucified. We were not there when he was resurrected. We were not there when he ascended. Okay, we cannot be apostles according to this job description. And guess what? Neither can Paul. He doesn't meet the criteria that is established in Acts. So that can be a bit of a problem. So how does Paul justify this? Well, he said, um, he's not really worried about his own authority. It's not about what he personally witnessed in Jesus's life because Jesus revealed himself to Paul after he had been resurrected. Jesus is the one who personally delivers the gospel message to Paul. Paul receives it directly from Christ. 
And for Paul, that is all the qualification you need to be an apostle. And so for him, it's not even about his own authority. It's about Christ's authority. And that's his primary concern. The primacy, the authenticity, the complete sufficiency of the good news that he has received from Christ is what makes him an apostle. So he never sees himself as the issue. For him, the issue is the truth of the gospel. He's the vessel. He's the messenger. He knows he's flawed. He knows that he has a past. He never lets that stop him because he is so totally and completely convinced that what he has received from Christ is authentic and sufficient. So we'll look back at verse four again, um, and, and specifically looking at this key verse in terms of the nature of salvation. And, and, and the reason I think, again, I'm, I'll just reiterate that this is important because it really helps us see that, that Paul is laying a groundwork for, for the entire scripturally based understanding of what we believe and practice as people of faith. So while this is specific in a lot of ways to the, the Galatians uh, letter, it, it, it ties into all of Paul's theology and it ties into all of scripture. And so it's helpful for us to have a basic understanding of this because it, is, it has broad implications for us. So as, as we look at verse four and, and thinking about, um, about uh, our uh, salvation, Paul seems to argue that Christ does not deal with sin by offering individual forgiveness, but with defeating sin and sweeping aside all of the power of sin. And so, um, you know, uh, a lot of times we, um, we think about this in terms of, uh, you know, we've got, um, we, we've got to have God forgive our own personal sins. And, that is true. However, Paul sees it beyond just our, our individual sin nature uh, to our human condition. And so what Christ does through his death and resurrection is defeat the power of sin. And that is, it's a key distinction. It might be hair splitting for some, um, but it's important. So Paul then goes on to assert that Christ is not just a passive actor in his death. Uh, as, as the ancient church father Chrysostom put it, the ministry that Christ undertook was free and uncompelled. You see this exhibited over and over again in the Gospel of John, where Jesus says things, um, I take up my life and I lay it down again. Nobody does this for me. He, he always talks in in. Um, in, in fact, in the Gospel of John, if you read the uh, Passion narrative, um, what happens when Christ dies is he gives up his spirit. Like he decides, okay, it's time to die. And he just, he just, he is so active in his own agents, in his own agency, in his own death, that he literally just says, okay, I'm giving up my spirit. I'm dying now. And, and that's so important. Um, for, for Paul to reiterate. Um, so, so he's um, looking to say that, that, that uh, this is the nature of the Christ that you are following. He's active and he has accomplished so much for you already. And so he's, this is a really key and a really important verse for Paul. Now, at this point in a Pauline letter, we might expect um, words of thanksgiving from Paul, to, for Paul to say, I give thanks for you constantly, or I'm so thankful for you. And that doesn't happen in this letter. And that's actually a, a really key thing. It, it helps us understand the gravity of the situation in Paul's mind. It also helps us appreciate, uh, as we're reading other Pauline letters, how important those messages of thanksgiving really are. A lot of times we read over those kinds of of uh, things to get to the meatier stuff, the weightier stuff. And, and so we, we read right over those, those Thanksgiving messages or um, towards the end of the letters as he, he gives uh, personal greetings 
um, you know, we might read over that or those, uh, you know, grace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We, we, we sometimes sweep those to the side to get to the more important stuff. Um, noticing that it's missing, though, is, is really important. Uh, he jumps immediately to astonishment and anger. He rebukes the Galatians for deserting the one. And, and he's, again, he's not talking about himself here. He's talking about God. God is the one who graciously called them in Christ. He's just the messenger. He didn't call them. He delivered the call. Okay, the call is from Christ. And, and they've deserted Christ. They're turning to a different gospel. And Paul says, no, it's not even a different gospel. It's a non-gospel. What you're, what you're subscribing to here is not gospel. It's not good news. It's bad news. And so he's pretty harsh in these opening sentences. Um, yet while they sound harsh, they establish the reality that nobody, no matter what anybody says in opposition to him, he is not out here to please people. He's not a people pleaser. He, it, he's not out to win any popularity contests. He is Christ's slave, Christ's servant. And the only person that he wants to please is Christ alone. Now, think about that in the context of your own ministry. Isn't that a, isn't that a terrible fine line to walk? Uh, you know, I, I mean, if, if we adopted that mindset and attitude in our own preaching, uh, that, that, you know, we have a hard message to deliver, uh, and we, we just can't, we, we can't base how we deliver that message or what the message is, the content of the message is, based on um, whether or not people are going to leave uh, the church afterwards and not come back. And they're never going to come and, and hear us preach again. Um, I, I, I wrestle with that tension a lot in my own ministry. And, and I'm sure that, that you do as well. Um, Paul just says, I don't wrestle with that I, because I, I've resolved it for myself. Um, you know, Christ is the one I'm out to please. And if my message uh, it, adheres to what Christ has revealed to me, uh, I'm going to continue to preach it regardless of if you don't like me, and, and regardless if, if you get upset with me and take issue with me. Um, and it's because he is so absolutely confident and convinced of the truth of his message. And that conviction is so powerful. Um, and it is something that I think is commendable to all uh, people in ministry, myself and you, all of us together have, uh, have this challenge before us. And so... As we think about Galatians, we're, we're looking at a specific problem facing this community. These folks are being inundated by uh, this message uh, that is contrary to the gospel that Paul has uh, preached to them, specifically in terms of circumcision and, and Torah uh, fidelity. Um, that obviously isn't a challenge for maybe any of our congregations in Huntington today. Um, however, do our churches, do our congregations face some form of perversion to the gospel of Christ crucified and the gift of the Spirit that we are tasked with proclaiming? Uh, this again, you know, this helps us as scripture, helps us to think about contemporary issues in an ancient context. Um, you know, as the writer of Ecclesiastes says, there is nothing new under the sun. So surely we can think about ways that our ministries are challenged to add something to the supremacy of Christ for salvation uh, that we face today, that we wrestle with in our own context. Um, maybe, you know, may, maybe they're, they're pretty innocuous. Uh, you know, uh, you have to come to church dressed a certain way or else you're really not a member of the community. I remember um, one of the congregations I used to serve had two uh, worship services um, that were very different. They had a traditional service and a contemporary service. The traditional service was 
held in a very stately old sanctuary that was beautiful and ornate. And the contemporary service was held in a, a gymnasium fellowship room that was dark and theatrical looking and had chairs instead of pews and had guitars and drums and a stage. And you, I mean, they were, they, they almost looked like they didn't belong in the same building. And they definitely were different communities, even though they were part of the same church. Um, and I remember one Sunday I was preaching at both services and I was preaching in the sanctuary first. And because of the way the services were scheduled, you almost had to run from one service to the other in order to get there on time. And so I had finished preaching up in the sanctuary and I left, went down into the contemporary service and I had still, I still had my, my coat and tie on. And I get downstairs and I, I preach downstairs and uh, we end the worship service and do the sending, the blessing. And somebody came up to me and they said, you know what, we don't dress like that down here. We don't wear ties, we don't wear jackets. That's not who we are. And, <laughs> um, you know, you know, in, in, in that person's mind, you know, part of the qualifications of, um, of being part of the community where you had to dress a certain way. That's pretty uh, innocuous. Uh, some people, it's, it's hair length or hair color or, you know, tattoos or piercings or, you know, and those are pretty superficial kinds of things. For others, there's, um, there's doctrinal issues and theological issues, and, and these can be very deep. Uh, you know, you have to believe a certain way about how salvation works, how Christ's death became effectual. You know, um, that, can be, uh, that can be a barrier to the gospel. Um, uh, you know, it can be, it can be more cultural or, or um, uh, more uh, societal. Um, it might be you have to belong to a certain political party or a certain uh, political ideology in order to truly be a Christian. Um, you, you know, so you can begin to see how this can be a little pernicious and subversive. Um, and, and so it's worth our time to think about that because I do believe it is a problem for uh, the church today. Ultimately, as we finish up talking about the, uh, the opening of chapter one, what Paul is doing is, is he's holding up the cross and emphasizing how God loves the Galatians. Not if God loves them. That's a well-established fact. He's showing them how God has loved them and continues to love them. So he's saying the Christian faith is not a religion that is meant to satisfy the claims of the Mosaic law, the Torah. It is rather a way of life that is focused on meeting the obligations of love. Again, love is one of the three central uh, tenets of Pauline faith um, and how it's expressed, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And so he's going to continue to demonstrate that how God loves them serves as the model of how they love God and one another in community. Uh, I'm going to, we're going to stop here. We're in a good place to stop. And I'm going to, um, we're going to take a, we're going to take a break at 11 o'clock. So um, let's just, let's just come back together and, and, uh, and, and go ahead and unmute yourselves and let me know what are you thinking right now? What are you thinking at this point? What questions do you have? Nancy. Jack, what is the, the theological thinking of why the Gospels were written later? Why did they not write down what was going on while Jesus was with them? That's an excellent question, Nancy. Um, and we don't, have a, uh, we don't have a definitive answer uh, to that. However, what the predominant line of thought is, is that these people who were part of the way, the Jesus movement, believed that Christ would be coming back in their lifetime. And they, they felt like Jesus was going to 
uh, come back and, and the parousia would happen, the, the end times, so to speak, that, mm. um, and, and that, that they, the, 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 the time would be complete. And so if that's your thinking, right now. spend a lot of time writing books, especially when you consider this is the, the ancient world, the first century, Finding somebody to write something is not the easiest task. Mm -hmm. that nobody had a laptop. Most people didn't have paper. So, um, you know, writing down something was uh, a huge investment. And, and so if, if Jesus is giving this very urgent message, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, hand. It's within grasp. Get out there and... Proclaim the good news. You got to tell as many people as you can because the clock starts now. Go. Uh, you're not going to sit around and, and say, okay, well, I got to write a book. <laughs> um, and so they, there was a, the oral transmission because that was what was most uh, prudent and, and okay. a effective, use, uh, uh, good use of time and resources. So then... It's as these, you know, as, as these first witnesses begin to die out, as the original community begins to pass away, people are starting to look around and say, oh, gosh, uh, we need to get a record of this in case they much longer. <laughs> and years later, we can say it went on a lot longer. Uh, and we don't know when it's going to, you know, when, when all this is going to culminate. And so having a written record becomes a lot more important. Okay, that's, that's helpful, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Other thoughts or questions? Hmm. Nothing? All right, <laughs> that's okay. We're going to take our break. Um, I will see you back here at 1130. Um, and uh, um, don't forget, there's the uh, chat feature in, in uh, Zoom, and you can use the reactions um, but, um, for that as well. Um, and so we'll, we'll spend another hour and a half together from 1130 to 1. And, uh, and then we'll kind of wrap that wrap, wrap up today. Uh, and I'll look forward to seeing you then again. Uh, the session will be recorded for us so that others can, can participate later on. So uh, have, a, have a great break and I'll see you in a half an hour. God bless you. <clears throat>